guys know Kelly Corrigan? She's written a bunch of New York Times bestsellers like The Middle Place and Tell Me More. And she has a weekly interview show on PBS with guests like David Byrne, Steve Kerr, Melinda Gates, and Judy Woodruff. She also has a twice-weekly podcast, which has just cracked the top 1% of downloads, called Kelly Corrigan Wonders, where she talks with writers and actors, thinkers and doers, in the hopes that knowing more and feeling more will help us to do more and be better. It's smart, funny, intimate, and useful. Episodes drop every Tuesday and Friday. Subscribe to Kelly Corrigan Wonders wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Damore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 58, Does My Child Have OCD? You've got to explain something to me. I just recently cleaned out my garage. There are so many places in my home that needs to be cleaned out. Why did it bring me such joy and relief to have the freaking garage clean? Of all the places, Lisa, why the garage? Probably because you, you could do it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's so nice to have a task that you can do from start to finish. It sounds like you got it done. Whereas yeah. the whole house is overwhelming. Yeah, I, it could be. But I'm just like, I'm not living in the garage. But <laughs> I think about it all the time. My garage is clean. Things are up and, and put on racks. So it gives you a good feeling. It, it does. You, yes, absolutely. It does give me a good feeling. Um, we're going to delve in, actually, to the topic of OCD, which I always have said to myself, I wish I was OCD and more because mm. I think of people as organized. You're going to tell me if we dispel that myth or not. Um, here's the letter we got from a parent. It says, my 10-year-old daughter has brought up some concerns around some OCD-style behavior she sees in herself, things like needing to have her desk chair in the exact right spot when she isn't using it. Her closet door can't be ajar. Her stuffies have to be lined up exactly the same or else she's afraid they'll, quote, be upset. And needing to wash her hands if she touches the garbage can, not because of germs, but just a compulsion feeling that she has to do it. This has been going on with her pre-COVID. It doesn't seem like COVID has exacerbated it, but I'm not sure. I've asked her if she's worried about it, and she says yes, but she's used to it. She's very high achieving in school, extracurricular activities as well, without being pressured by us. But she really puts pressure on herself to be, quote, perfect, but definitely struggles with some anxiety. But overall, I would say she has a very happy life, good friends, and loving family. How do you recommend I proceed? I don't want her to feel self-conscious about it or turn it into something bigger unnecessarily. But I also don't want her hurt in the long run by downplaying it either. Please help. So I'm going back to my question here. I'm, as somebody who doesn't know or understand OCD, thinking she's organized. She's got her desk chair in the right place. She washes her hands when she thinks it feels icky. Is this so bad? It's a tough one, Rita. Um, it can be. It can be. And, and, and I, I've cared for people whose lives became absolutely dominated by obsessive and compulsive behaviors and just um, really imprisoned by it. So, wow. Okay. So we want to um, think about the continuum on which this exists because it does. And you don't really want anyone, especially your own child, finding themselves moving further and further up that continuum of having obsessive and compulsive concerns mm -hmm. in their lives. Um, Could you just define for us, Lisa, what is OCD to begin with? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that people talk about, it, like, oh, yes. that's OCD, whatever. And, totally. And it's actually one of the better named disorders. Sometimes we have names for disorders that when I've taught abnormal psychology classes to college students, I'm like, okay, this name doesn't make sense. Here's what we really mean. But for obsessive compulsive disorder, the explanation is actually in the name. So an obsession is a worry, a thought that is upsetting. And then the compulsion is the behavior the person does to reduce the anxiety caused by the thought. So that's that's the construction. So obsession and then compulsion. So a thought and then a behavior 
that get linked and the thought is anxiety provoking and the behavior somehow causes the anxiety to go down. And so if we think about the hand washing, and, and I, I heard in this letter that the writer said it's not that, you know, the kid's worried yeah. or hands are dirty, but there's something to it. A compulsive feeling are. is yeah. the, what the parent describes here. Yeah. Yeah. So if we think about people who get into obsessive hand washing, the thought is, oh, my gosh, my hands are dirty or I'm contaminated or I have germs. So that's the anxiety provoking obsession. And then the compulsion is, well, I'll go wash my hands. So that's the behavior and you can see in that one a very logical pairing between the obsessive thought about germs and then the compulsive behavior around cleanliness and how that compulsive behavior would temporarily reduce anxiety. And that's where this gets tricky, which is it becomes reinforced. So mm. I have this thought, I do this thing, and my anxiety goes down. So when the anxiety comes back, there's this powerful urge to do the compulsive behavior. Oh. And, and it can really then reinforce itself very powerfully. And where we worry is if um, there's this sense of can't stop, right? Mm. I can't not do it. So Meaning you can't control it. You can't control it. So like, say um, I took care of a little boy who had this... Um, obsessive compulsive kind of thing happening where he was worried he might say a swear word out loud in church. This was his worry. He, it was his okay. obsessive concern. He was thinking okay. about it and worrying about it all the time. And so he came up with this system where he felt that if he walked from the car to the door of the church and he could arrive on an even numbered step, that then he wouldn't swear in church. Like he had this idea. And We'll come back to how, like, it doesn't really make a ton of sense, you know, but he had this idea. And so then if he would get to the step, the door of the church and be on an odd numbered step, he would feel he had to go all the way back to the car to start again. Like he couldn't not, he couldn't go in the church. Like he was, it was a can't stop feeling. And, and so sometimes for parents, they're like, what are you doing? You know, like the kid's like, I got to go back to the car. I got to go back to the car. And it looks you know, difficult or naughty, but it's like they can't not do the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what OCD is. And it can get pretty disruptive. Mm. When do you think a parent needs to intervene and get help? I wouldn't actually wait too long. Really? Um, yeah. I, can I just say, I'm shocked to hear you say this because I've always associated OCD as like a good thing. Like it's just like thrown, it's like a psychological term that's thrown around. And as somebody who's not type A, I'm always like, oh, I wish I was a little more organized. But what I'm hearing from you is it's not organization. It's so much more than that. It is. Well, but okay, but to rest on this idea, Raina, because you're not wrong, right? Um, so say a person has an obsessive concern that there's a typo in an important essay they're sending somewhere or like mm -hmm. an article. Mm -hmm. And so their compulsion is to very, very carefully um, proofread it. And so the obsessive thought is, I'm worried there's a typo. The compulsion is a behavior that actually can check for typos. And it keeps them from sending in articles or pieces or whatever that have mistakes in them. Fundamentally, that's a good thing, right? That's going to make their work better. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. The, what we want to watch out for, and this is where the line gets crossed, which is it stops being functional. It starts to get in the way. So there's some people who can't send their work in because oh. they are so anxious that there might be an error in it, that they are compulsively going over and over and over it again. And it turns from being adaptive, right, improving the quality of one's work, to actually hamstringing the person and they're, you know, they can't get their work in on time or they feel, you know, really, really uncomfortable when it finally gets pulled out of their hands, you know. So that's the, um, you know, it's interesting that most psychopathology occurs on a continuum. Like most things that we ultimately diagnose have garden variety versions in daily life. And mm -hmm. OCD is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm thinking about our desks, right? You and I, it's just so typical of our, <laughs> yours is always nice and tidy. And mine is like mountains of paper all over, nothing like manila folders scattered everywhere. And I, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, okay, I got to clean this up. This is just gross. But it's not stopping me from doing the podcast or doing yeah. other, when, when is it really a problem? Like when I'm thinking about it and it is preventing me from doing my work sometimes, but when does it become a red flag. Well, this child, it's not really, it seems like, getting in her way that much. You know, that, and I think yes. that's where this, this parent's letter is really thoughtful of like, do mm -hmm. I make a big deal of this or am I going to look back on this and wish I had made a bigger deal of it? And, um, and I would say, you know, if a person of any age has, you know, kind of obsessive compulsive tendencies in a in a basically functional domain, you know, something where like they double check their writing or they um, just one more time go back in and check to make sure the stove is off, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And it it's, you know, it fits with making sense in the world and they, you know, they can check it once or twice and be done with it. I would leave it be. Um, if, however... And, you know, and I, this could be up for debate. I mean, you know, this is sort of what I'm thinking as I go. I might, you know, I, I, let me think it through a little bit more. But what makes me a little concerned about this child is there's several things she's doing. And it's clearly caught up with worry that's kind of vague, like worried that the stuffed animals will be upset, you know, needing the yes. door closed. There's not, it doesn't really have a functional purpose, right? Like straightening the stuffed animals isn't checking to make sure that you actually did turn off the stove, right? I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't sort of have that kind of real world implications. And what we know is, and I think this may already be underway, obsessive compulsive behaviors can start to spread. And sometimes they're about very specific concerns, like my hands are dirty, and so mm -hmm. I wash my hands a lot. But Often, and especially with younger kids, they're about much more amorphous, like, I feel uneasy, so I'm going to go touch all of the furniture in this very particular order. Oh. Now I feel better, right? Like, and, and really? it can be these, yeah, these, you know, these interesting, you know, kind of pairings. And then what happens is when they feel uneasy, they may go do that. And then they may find like, oh, but yet I still feel uneasy. Okay, so I'm going to add a ritual. I'm also going to close all the doors. Okay. Mm, yep. I still feel uneasy. So I'm going to do the touching. I'm going to do the door closing. And I'm also going to straighten all the pillows. Yeah. And and that's where it can start to spin into this life-disrupting, dominating uh. world. And, um, and we, no one wants that for themselves mm. or their child. You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned rituals about things that might help because... In Hinduism, there are bhajans, like prayers, chants, mantras that you say. Um, I think in the church for Catholics or, you know, I grew up in the Syrian Orthodox Church, there's Hail Marys or similar prayers yeah, that you kind of... Yeah, yourself or things. Yes, yeah. yes. How does that help? Well, it's funny because it's so good that you bring this up because we do have all of these, like, rituals that we use in religion or in life um, that... If you really look at them hard, you're like, that's kind of random, you know, mm -hmm. like that we decide that that thing protects you from that other thing. So it's not actually a big stretch to have this idea of, I feel anxious, I'll go touch the furniture, right? That there's other versions of that in our worlds where we have something we wish were different or we have a feeling that's uneasy. And so then we do something that isn't obviously logically linked to it and it gives a sense of relief. What's different here, first of all, is there's a whole bunch of stuff that's culturally sanctioned, right? Like we yeah. all agree prayer is a thing, right? Or a lot yeah. of people agree prayer is a thing. And so we don't, you know, it, it's sort of in the bounds of what we normally expect people to be doing if that's what they do. But it's also, it's the disruptive question, right? So there are also people who could find themselves feeling that they have to repeat silent prayers mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again to the point where they can't really focus on their work or they can't do the things they need to do. So it's that line of, um, yeah, we all have rituals or lots mm -hmm. of people do religions, entire religions sanction, you know, agreed mm -hmm. upon rituals. But the question we want to always come back to is, 
is this getting in the person's way or is it making their life click along as they need it to click mm-hmm. along, right? That whatever the category is. And then if you start to see the spreading that I think is actually quite beautifully described in this letter, you know, that it's it's now several rituals, then I would say, okay, it's time to um, to interfere with this. It's time to, to treat this. Is there an age where OCD really begins? You know, it's funny. There's points in development where kids can look a little OCD. It's interesting around toileting. Um, kids can look pretty oh, OCD because they're, really? you know, they're thinking early. about the bodies. Yeah. And they're also suddenly thinking a lot about poop and where it goes. And I took care of a little kid who was toileting and who was a very obsessive. This will crack you up. It was actually very sweet, but also very, um, in some ways, very concrete um, about the brown crayons uh-huh. and the urine colored crayons, you know, <laughs> needing to be very, very carefully organized so that they were at the furthest distance from the non toileting uh-huh. looking uh-huh. crayons. Uh-huh. And was and was very rigid about this and had the parents concern that there was obsessive phenomenology at work. And there kinda was, but it was also very much bound to the developmental moment of this kid thinking a lot about poop and pee and trying to get it where it belongs and away from everything else. Mm-hmm. And so Typically, stuff like that will um, resolve of its own accord. You know, as soon as toileting becomes mastered and feels more comfortable, the crayons can all be mixed up again. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, But I would say um, it could start pretty much at any point. Really? Okay. Yeah, and I will say we saw a lot more of it in the pandemic. We're seeing quite a bit more. And I I would just chalk that up to, like, vague and, you know, um, uncomfortable and hard to describe anxiety, right? Just like this sense of like free-floating anxiety. And if Mm. you can, you know, if you can give yourself a break from it for a minute by, you know, doing some ritual, I get it. I get why we're seeing more of this. So Lisa, can greater anxiety lead to OCD? And also is OCD inherited? That's a good question. So we consider OCD to be an anxiety disorder. And Anxiety disorders can, without question, be inherited. Um, And so, yes, this can run in families. And the other way to think about this, Rena, if you're asking kind of the developmental question, um, one thing that my colleagues and I started to observe in the pandemic is that we were seeing OCD in younger kids and eating disorders in older kids. Oh, wow. And eating disorders are close neighbors to OCD, that often for eating disorders, especially the restricting ones, the obsession is I'm fat and the compulsion is I'm going to go run 10 miles. And so um, if you had like Boolean overlap, Mm -hmm, (laughs) there's mm -hmm. Boolean overlap between obsessive compulsive behaviors and eating disordered behaviors that one of the phrases we use in psychology is that um, our diagnostic system does not cleave nature at its joints. You know, that there's, there's overlap. So, if you're a parent and you think your kid might need treatment, what are your options? I'd start with some home remedies. I would give it a try. And the technical term we use is exposure and response prevention. So mm-hmm. ERP, <laughs> exposure mm-hmm. and response prevention, which is basically to not let them do the compulsion, to make them ride out the anxiety until it dies down of its own accord, to not have the reinforcement of doing the compulsive behavior. So that sounds so hard. It is hard and it's uncomfortable. And you'll want probably to teach your child some anxiety management strategies before you do this. So, you know, we've talked about breathing as a way to bring anxiety down. We've talked about reframing things. You know, is it really dangerous to have your hands maybe be dirty or are you going to be okay? Do you have a good working immune system? And so I would, if I were a parent, I would look up some techniques for helping manage anxiety, breathing, reframing, have those ready, and then say to your child, you know what, I'm going to ask you to not um, straighten your chair. I'm going to ask you to wash your hands only after you use the restroom Mm -hmm. or before you eat. And I know you're going to get uncomfortable, and I'm here to help you with that discomfort. But we need to find ways for you to manage your discomfort that don't involve these rituals because they're kind of taking over. So I that's where a parent would want to start. 
um, which is basically to uncouple the anxiety from the ritualized behavior that is very, very temporarily getting that anxiety to go down. Lisa, I also want to get to the part of this letter where the parent talks about perfectionism. How do you help your kids with that? Yeah, it's so common um, and so punishing, you know, so often for kids. What can you say? Like, I think we all strive to be perfect and great. And, you know, you've got social media, you know, putting out these images of what you should be and look like. What what works when you're trying to get your kids to understand it's not about being perfect? Yeah, um, I think there's two things. You know, I, for me, especially with um, school-age kids, I, I quickly make a division in my mind around perfectionism around schoolwork and perfectionism around everything else. Mm-hmm. Because the perfectionism around the schoolwork is um, hugely taxing on time and um, stress. And for me, what I'm really interested in watching in a kid's academic development is I want to see kids get their work ethics in place. I actually do want to see every kid come to a point where they know actually how to do something to its highest level that they can do. You know, that um, we don't want kids phoning it in all the time. Serena, if, if you think about your kids, do you feel that they're both in a place where if they had to polish something to an incredibly high shine, they know how to do that? I don't know that they necessarily would. I think when they're passionate about something, they naturally do that. But when they're not, I don't yeah. think they even strive to try to reach that goal. Yeah, so... I think we want kids to be, we want them to develop that skill set. And developmentally, they're not really probably where they have that yet, mm-hmm. but you're, you're, you're working on it right now. That we want kids, even on the work they don't like, and that is the key point in this, mm-hmm. even on the work they don't like, we want them to show us that if they have to do something at 100%, they have the work ethic to do it. Like we really need kids to develop that kind of work ethic. So I wouldn't worry about perfectionism until that's in place. And and usually if a kid's perfectionistic, that's going to get in place pretty early. Only then do we start to um, chip away a bit at a perfectionistic work ethic. Mm-hmm. And the way to do that at school is to talk about it in terms of tactics, right? So when does it make good sense for you to polish something to a high shine? When is it tactical in terms of your energy and your time and your need for sleep for you to phone this in, you know, or to do less or to, um, you know, I, bluntly, I would say cut corners. You know, mm-hmm. we, we don't usually talk about school that way. But I think especially for hyper conscientious kids, it's helpful to say, you know, there's times when you give it your all and there's times where you find the quickest, fastest path and take it. Um, so I think that's one approach. Um, but then on the overall perfectionism, the, the best thinking I ever saw on this comes from a psychologist I really admire named Nancy McWilliams. And she was talking about how when we are trying to work against perfectionism in our clients, part of how we do it is we model for them that we can acknowledge our own shortcomings while still holding ourselves at a reasonable level of self-regard. That we can um, say like, oh, you know what? I, I apologize. I I started this session late. I owe you some time at the end if you can do that today. You know, so to own, you know, own our mistakes and shortcomings, but without this bowing, scraping, I'm so awful. I hate myself. You know, so we can do this all the time in parenting. We can mm-hmm. both acknowledge our shortcomings while making it clear like, I mean, I still feel like I'm an okay person, you know, and and I think that's how we model behavior that can work against perfectionism in our kids. Mm. Wow. You have just opened the door wide open on a topic, I think, that people throw around but know nothing about. I I am shocked at how little I knew about this topic. Yeah. Let me add one more thing, because I think parents should know this. Medication can also help. Mm. Um, I'm never a fan of medication without a good evaluation or I like I would really rather have a kid also in psychotherapy. But for some folks whose OCD gets very out of control, where they just have these um, really 
persistent and extremely uncomfortable worries and thoughts, maybe about contamination or that they're going to do something dangerous or something like that, and they can't get it to stop, antidepressants have turned out to be very effective at making those obsessive thoughts quieter. Mm. And and so I would not offer it as a first line of defense, and I would want it to be done really thoughtfully. But I just... I just want people to know that psychotherapy can be very effective, especially exposure and response prevention psychotherapy. And then, you know, working with someone really, really careful and thoughtful if needed to consider the possibility of medication if that um, might give some desperately Mm. needed relief. Mm. So for parents who want more, Lisa, are there resources out there or a website or something that we can direct parents to? You know, there are some good books on this. Um, Edna Foa. FOA is somebody who's written really thoughtfully. She's a real expert in this field. So I'll put in the show notes um, some books that I think will be useful to families. That is so great. And what do you have for us for Parenting to Go? We've talked a lot about anxiety on this podcast over time, and it feels like a good time to revisit the difference between healthy and unhealthy anxiety. So healthy anxiety is what we feel when something's really wrong, and it helps us to pay attention and make a change. And unhealthy anxiety is when we feel anxious, but nothing's really wrong, or we feel way too anxious for the situation. And so OCD, you can see, fits pretty um, clearly in the second category. And that can make it distinct from just the general anxiety that we sometimes feel as human beings. That's one of the things I've learned from you throughout our seasons here, is that anxiety is perfectly normal and can be healthy, but then there are moments where it needs to be checked. Yep. Sometimes it can get too much. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, I still am grateful I went to Costco and got those metal wires to hang all my stuff up in the garage. Absolutely. <gasps> Absolutely. It and makes you feel me feel really, it feels so much better. Yes. I, I love my metal shelving. I got to tell you. So next week, we're going to talk about what do you do if your daughter is the mean girl in school? All right. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you next week, Rena. Sounds great. See you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.